Well, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, this North American special for the so uh, Society of Army Historical Research. Um, it seems only a few months ago that we were going through these online talks for the centenary program, uh, and some of you were lucky enough to attend a session in September at the National Army Museum, uh, a live session, and I wish I'd been there, but um, I was actually in France on the battlefields at the time. Um, just to remind people how this works, uh, you can see that there is a chat box, and I've invited people to just write in and uh, say who they are and where they're from. Um, and I'll leave that chat box will continue to be open throughout the talk. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end of each speaker's talk this evening. Um, and to make things run quickly, what we're asking you to do is to write your questions in the uh, chat box as they occur to you. Andrew Banford, who is moderating the session this evening, will then choose those questions. And if uh, subsequent to you asking the question, uh, the speaker answers it, well, then he clearly won't pose that question to the speaker. But it will, I assure you, speed things along if you can write the questions in the chat box as they occur to you. The system we're using is Demio. Uh, and once again, those of you that have attended one of these sessions before will remember how it works. Uh, for nine out of 10 people, you will experience no problems at all this evening. But there will always be one or two that have problems with either their audio or their video. Um, that's because Demio requires on the strength of the internet connection at your end. So if you are having any problems with audio or um, video this evening, uh, there are three immediate action drills that you can apply uh, to help sort out the problem. The first is to refresh your page. And for those that don't know how to do that, on almost every browser, there is an incomplete circle with an arrow on it. If you click on that, that just refreshes your page. The second IA drill you can employ is to um, do the what I call the IT solution, the IT crowd solution, which is basically to close down the browser and then come back in again using the same link that you use this evening to join the session. And the third IA drill that you can apply, apply if those two don't work for you, um, is to use a different browser if indeed you have that option. So perhaps you're joining us this evening on Chrome, uh, then perhaps if you've got Safari on your computer, use the link that you've been sent in Safari and see if that works. Um, unfortunately, if one of those three IA drills does not work for you this evening, then there's very little that I can do to help you. But what we will be doing is automatically sending out a copy of the recording this evening as soon as the session finishes. So if you are in the unfortunate position where you can't see or hear the presentations this evening and the IA drills don't work for you, then rest assured you will get a copy of the recording um, later on this evening and certainly by first thing tomorrow morning. So on that note, I'm going to take myself off screen and hand you over to this evening's moderator, Andrew Bramford. Thank you, Dudley. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, unexpected uh, final session. Um, uh, as, as many of you are, are aware, we, we had the, uh, the live event uh, last month uh, at the National Army Museum, which was uh, intended to be the grand finale of the, uh, the Centenary Research Conference. Unfortunately, with COVID uh, still imposing travel restrictions, our, our four North American speakers were, uh, were unable to join us uh, live and uh, so we, we, we've put on this uh, this extra session that uh, you're, you're all uh, attending tonight um, just while we're waiting for people to join um, I, I did think it would be at least gives me the opportunity since we uh, we, we are uh, gathering again and with a different audience just just to repeat uh, a few words that I said at the opening of the uh, of the session in September Three or four years ago, the society adopted the uh, the strapline 
uh, serving uh, scholars, enthusiasts, uh, and soldiers. And the thing that has really impressed me as we've gone through this series of, of talks and lectures is that we've managed to draw on all of those groups um, uh, to a, a really diverse range of, uh, uh, of speakers and topics. Uh, we, 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 we've, had, uh, we've had scholars from distinguished senior professors to uh, a PhD student presenting at their very first uh, conference. We've had soldiers from non-commissioned officers up to field rank. Uh, and we've had enthusiasts of uh, uh, of every stamp. Um, and it, it's been particularly pleasing as well that nearly a third of the speakers uh, have, have been women, considering some of the recent comments about the lack of uh, diversity in uh, in the field of military history. And uh, what I would really hope that the society takes away from these centenary events is. Uh, is that we we can grow on that and and build on that and and hopefully become a a bigger and better and more diverse uh, organisation as as we go into our uh, our second century. So that that's my my hope out of uh, all this. We um we have a slight change to the uh, program as advertised. You've still got the same four papers, but unfortunately one of the speakers uh, ha has a pressing appointment and it isn't able to stay for the whole of the evening. So what we'd intended to do uh, and what was advertised was to have a standalone paper and then a panel of uh, of three sessions uh, um, all on uh, uh, North American topics. Um, unfortunately, we can't do the papers in the order that we'd hoped. So we're going to have each paper individually, as, uh, as Dudley has mentioned. Um, we're going to have uh, a short Q&A of 10 minutes or so after each of the papers. Uh, and we'll, we'll we'll move through like that. Uh, and since it's going to be quite a long session with four speakers, we'll have a short break uh, between the second and third papers, just if uh, if, if people need to uh, replenish glasses or or empty bladders or uh, any other uh, things people might want to attend to. Um, I'm conscious that we're uh, we're slightly ahead of the uh, the advertised start time still, but I'm. Uh, I'm racking my brains to think that I can cover another seven minutes. So uh, my uh, my feeling is that we uh, we carry on with the uh, with the program from now. Um, uh, and with that in mind, I I'd like to ask uh, Rick Herrera, our first uh, speaker, to uh, to join me on the stage. Welcome, uh, welcome, Rick. Uh, Rick is a uh, professor, professor of military history at the uh, US Army uh, Command and Staff College. Um, he's written extensively on the uh, uh, the American War of Independence, and uh, he will be speaking for us tonight about the uh, uh, logistic and re logistical and resource aspects of the uh, the campaign around uh, Philadelphia. So, uh, without uh, any further ado, I shall uh, I shall make myself scarce, uh, and we'll get on with our first paper of the evening. Thank you, Rick. All right, very good. Thanks so much, Andrew, and thank you all for attending. Thank you very much to the uh, society. Uh, within a day of completing landing operations at Head of Elk on 26 August 1777. British forces began their search for food uh, at, immediately. Captain Johann Ewald and his Jaegers found oxen, sheep, turkeys, and all kind of wild fowl as they patrolled to the west. But since they did not find any of the enemy, we skirmished with these animals and feasted. In itself, this was not remarkable, but it suggests the reality of British strategy in America following the capture and subsequent occupation of Philadelphia from October 1777 through May 1778 the preoccupation with provender and fuel. General Sir William Howe had defeated General George Washington at Brandywine in September and then Germantown in October. After declining battle at White Marsh in early December, Howe devoted his energies to foraging, gathering food for his soldiers, their horses, and the livestock that fed the army, but also the wood to heat their quarters. These expeditions sometimes comprised as much as half the army. Missives to uh, Lord George Germain, the colonial secretary to the contrary, full larders were Howe's strategic raison d'etre. 
forgive my pronunciation, how viewed procuring provisions, forage, and fuel as a means to limited ends, food and warmth for survival, whereas his opponent, Washington, understood the matter more comprehensively. While the Continental Army struggled mightily with its catastrophically poor commissariat and quartermaster systems throughout the entirety of the war, during its occupation of Valley Forge from December of 1777 through May of 1778, Washington used the search for provisions and forage as means and ways toward more far-reaching ends. Besides survival, Washington used the competition for foodstuffs to deprive the British Army of its needs and to contest its occupation and influence. Although Washington never succeeded in fully denying Howe's army of food, forage, and firewood, he forced Howe to expend tremendous effort in doing so. British foraging and woodcutting parties did not venture out of Philadelphia in anything less than battalion strength. Indeed, it was altogether too risky. Howe's foragers more often marched out in brigade and even larger formations. At the outset of the war, British officials assumed they would be able to sustain all of King George's men with local purchases of food and other military goods. Instead, that became the exception rather than the rule. The British Army had captured and held New York, but had failed to secure an area extensive enough to sustain its victualling needs. Instead, the Army relied heavily upon British butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, and others to supply them. It was to little avail. Throughout the war, the focus on capturing and holding ports was understandable and necessary, but without a large enough force to seize and defend rich agricultural areas, soldiers could do little more than secure these logistical hubs from which they mounted expeditions in search of the enemy, but more often in search of food and other supplies to supplement dwindling stocks. Foraging was a constant element in British operations and demanded an inordinate effort from the soldiers. General Howe launched six foraging expeditions in January of 1778, another six in February, and ten alone in March. Continentals in militia patrolling and foraging around Philadelphia forced the British to intensify their efforts and expend even more energy in the search for supplies. From the outset of the Philadelphia campaign, the British Army had been in search of food, forage, fodder, and other supplies, even as it sought battle. Let's see here, there we go. Now, Philadelphia, economically and politically important to the American cause, was but another port the British had to defend. Although historian R. Arthur Bowler de deemed 1777 the best year of the war in terms of provisions reserves, they still fell short of the six month rule of thumb preferred by commanders. From August through late October, the British Army subsisted off of the land and ate well, but not long afterward the easy availability of foodstuffs declined to the point that Howe's commissary general, Daniel Weir, informed the Treasury Office that the bulk of the Army's supplies would have to be shipped from Britain. Historians have estimated that it took one-third of a ton of food per year to feed a soldier in America, and that an army of 20,000 soldiers required 33 tons of food daily. From 1777 through the close of 1778, Britain dispatched 124 victuallers and transports averaging 220 tons burden to supply soldiers in North America. It was not, however, enough. Besides soldiers, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of horses used by the Army in Philadelphia. On average, each horse required 20 pounds of fodder, nine of uh, oats or corn daily. Much of the fodder came from Philadelphia, came from Rhode Island, brought to the Army by contracted merchant shipping. On land, they typically saw a vehicle such as these. The American threat to Howe's supply line was such that he deployed around 3,000 soldiers to escort wagon trains traveling to and from Chester, 15 miles southwest of Philadelphia. Still, it was not enough. In response, Howe sent out large foraging expeditions, sometimes lasting for as long as a week, sometimes employing upwards of half the army. Moreover, twice and thrice weekly woodcutting parties required covering forces of 500 or more soldiers to protect them. As Major Charles Stewart of the 43rd Regiment of Foot had observed in New York during the summer of 77, the threat of attack by militia and Continentals absolutely prevented us this whole war from going 15 miles from a navigable river. Previously, Stewart had railed against the neglect of those in high office who had 
who omitted making magazines of every species of forage when we were in possession of the greater part of the province of New York. Their neglect, Stuart charged, had forced the army to enter into a kind of petite guerre, which has kept the army the whole winter in perpetual harassment, and upon a modest computation, has lost us more men than the last campaign. Small as it was, the British army could ill afford to wage a wasting war of attrition. Yet, it had no other options. The want of supplies contributed to a breakdown in discipline and good order in some formations. Foraging parties continued their searches as the army settled into occupation duties. Robert Morton of Philadelphia singled out troopers of the light horse, likely the 16th or 17th light dragoons, for having taken hay and over 50 bushels of potatoes from his family. He received a receipt, however, for the load of hay. On the British Army's return to White Marsh, northwest of Philadelphia, Morton pointed to Hessian soldiers who brought off about 700 head of cattle. Not long after that, another column ventured west as, large, as Lord Charles Cornwallis, with a detachment of about 5,000 men, crossed the Schuylkill toward Darby to cover a foraging party of wagons. Cornwallis then led his force northward, where it briefly tangled with the advance guard of Washington's army as it marched west to Valley Forge. Colonel Pickering, the, uh, on the Board of War, damned the great devastations wrought by the barbarous wretches. But when Cornwallis returned to British lines, Captain Lieutenant John Peebles of the 42nd Regiment of Foot, better known as the Black Watch or the Royal Highland Regiment, observed less judgmentally that the column had made a good haul of forage, some cattle, and plunder. Peebles' remark about plunder reveals something of, to the extent to which soldiers took license while foraging, and their officers looked away or were unaware of the despoliation. British and Hessians had ransacked a house belonging to the Morton family and had visited destruction similar at Israel Pemberton's country home. Cornwallis's command, which Peebles had remarked on, had, according to Morton, plundered a number of inhabitants of everything they had upon their farms and abused many old inoffensive men. Morton was convinced that this was permitted under the command of their officers to ravage and destroy property. It was as if the army was inciting the inhabitants to rebellion by its indiscipline. Howe took notice. On 18 December 1777, Howe's orderly book recorded that he had given repeated orders against plundering and depredation. Throughout the tenure of his command, which dated to April 1776, interim in October, Howe had received a constant stream of complaints about the lawlessness of his soldiers and was very much mortified by the re their behavior and by having to enjoin subordinate commanders for their exertion to suppress such unsoldierlike behavior, so absolutely repugnant to military discipline and the larger mission of suppressing the rebellion and gaining adherence to the king's cause. Even before this latest injunction, courts martial had convicted and sentenced soldiers to floggings and executions. Lawlessness notwithstanding, foraging continued and alienation grew apace. The army and its horses had to be fed. Me show you here something of the size of the British Army. Unfortunately, this did not translate well, so you can see what the garrison of Philadelphia looked like. 30 battalions infantry, 2 regiments light dragoons, 10 battalions German infantry, 4 uh, battalions of provincials. It goes on to record basically the, uh, the fitness for duty. In total, some 79% of the army, so not too bad for the 18th century. You can see here within Philadelphia, total of 76% uh, uh, fit for duty. I did not, however, include New York or Rhode Island. On 21 December, Howe ordered over half the army, some 24 battalions according to one observer, and over 18 field guns and howitzers of varying calibers to prepare for a forage. Soldiers were ordered to bring three days of provisions and wagons of each corps three days rum. The next, dip, the next morning, Howe, seconded by Major General James Grant and Brigadier Generals Charles Gray and Alexander Leslie, crossed the Schuylkill at Gray's Ferry. They occupied Darby and sent covering parties to protect the wagons foraging and also small craft loaded at Tinicum Island further south. Um, the Grand Foraging Party lasted until the 28th of December. Continentals had harassed the foragers and killed or captured over a dozen, and the weather they reported had been very cold and disagreeable, I assure you, but it did not affect the progress of foraging.
Captain Lieutenant Peebles reckoned that Howe's foragers had brought in between three and four hundred tons of hay every day, over two thousand tons in total, which he believed would satisfy the Army's needs for four months. By Howe's estimate, it was only half that. Major uh, Carl Leopold Baumeister, Adjutant General of Hesse Castle Forces, observed critically that the forage had been brought, up, brought about by the neglect of British forage masters and commissaries who had allowed the stocks to fall to scanty supply. Nonetheless, Bauermeister deemed the expedition very successful. Foragers had seized 450 sheep, 180 head of cattle, along with hay, most of which had been loaded on ships, then sailed up the Schuylkill above Gray's Ferry Bridge, where it was offloaded. Thirty transports took part in the operation. The freezing weather, however, caused two brigs and a schooner to become icebound. The crews were unable to um, free them up and the currents from the Delaware drove them ashore on New Jersey, somewhere near Gloucester. As unfortunate as the loss of these transports was, it was the soldiers and civilians' criminality that enraged Howe. On the first day of December's Grand Forage, Howe's orderly book noted that two men are ordered for immediate execution of the crime of plundering. Howe was determined to punish with the utmost rigor every man detected in depredation of any kind. He more than realized the consequences of criminality. Besides alienating Americans, it ate the very fabric of the army, its orderliness, and its discipline, and threatened to turn the force into an armed mob. Most soldiers obeyed Howe's injunctions, but for some they went unheard or ignored. Near the end of the forage, courts martial tried and convicted Isaac Green, a Negro, and James Hamuel, inhabitant of the city of Philadelphia. The court, the court sentenced both men to 1,000 lashes, little better than a slow, painful death sentence. Green and Hamuel were not alone. Other defaulters' names entered the orderly book for plundering, along with their findings of guilt or the rare acquittals. With so much of the army engaged in feeding itself and its animals, it had little time to fight. The British Army's logistical shortfalls, therefore, gave the Continental Army much-needed breathing space. Time spent foraging was time given over to Washington soldiers for their own foraging. All this is not to say that the British Army did nothing more than forage, although that did take up most of its time and energy. While not by design, its activities necessarily competed for food and forage. Moreover, provincial formations conducted raids and patrols throughout the countryside, which compounded the Continental Army's problems. As redcoats patrolled the countryside around the city, British commissary agents, escorted by large formations, did their best to provision the army from local farms. Howe took care to safeguard his foragers and what they gleaned. On 26 January 1778, Howe's Hessian aide-de-camp, Captain Friedrich von Munchausen, noted the dispatch of three regiments this morning to cover our foragers and wagons, all of which returned unmolested. They brought almost 200 tons of hay into Philadelphia. Often enough, however, Lone farmers and millers brought in their goods to British lines. Sir William's foragers particularly favored the lands east of the Schuylkill, where loyalism was more pronounced, the enemy's presence was lightest, and there was less risk of being caught on the wrong side of a rising river. Colonel Walter Stewart, whose 13th Pennsylvania Continentals foraged northeast of Philadelphia County and uh, Bucks County, estimated that enough flour and other provisions to feed from 8,000 to 10,000 men goes daily to Philadelphia was carried in by single persons, wagons, horses, etc. But while a large quantity of Bucks County's bounty entered British lines, something that astounded Washington, British agents discovered that providing for the Army and Navy was still difficult. In southeastern Pennsylvania, specie and escorts to city markets might encourage many farmers, but fresh provisions were still difficult. Every family farm had different subsistence needs, and their political loyalties were as varied as their numbers, the region was anything but pacified. By February, Washington had received recent intelligence about Howe's intentions to make yet another grand forage. This suggested Howe would send a large portion of the army, perhaps half or more of it, in search of food, forage, and fodder. Washington had previously been unable to challenge the British columns. Moreover, this coincided with Washington's intention to launch the, lar the largest operation his army executed during its time at Valley Forge. This was the Grand Forge of 1778, in which he collapsed his eastern, eastern security line and dispatched columns under Major General Nathaniel Green, Brigadier General Anthony Wayne, and Captain Henry Lee, were how to launch a Grand Forge while these columns were beyond the fortifications of Valley Forge, 
Washington hazarded their making contact and coming to blows. Were that to happen, Howe's tactical acumen and superior numbers meant that British arms would likely prevail. It was a fight Washington could ill afford. Yet there was hope. British operational patterns did not suggest that Howe would seek battle. Washington likely took this into consideration as he balanced the Army's needs and the opportunities offered by a foraging expedition against the risks. He had taken Howe's measure over the course of 1776 and 77 and had come to understand his opponent. Skilled he was, but Sir William's need to feed and preserve Britain's precious few soldiers overrode whatever inclinations he might have had toward combat. Had Howe been inclined or able to attack, the column under Green presented a, a tempting target. It was exposed, a small formation of perhaps 1,500 soldiers. But two factors conspired against Howe. The first was the weather. Heavy rains and rising waters on 11 February had forced the British dism to dismantle their pontoon bridge over the Schuylkill River bordering the west of Philadelphia. Let's see how it came. Um, the second factor was the Army's constant need to replenish its own food and fuel. The Army's clock-like pattern of dispatching foraging and woodcutting parties spoke to its operational tempo. The size of the parties spoke to their importance and the threat from Continental and militia forces. Green was not on Howe's mind. The following day, British forces marched northeast, four miles beyond Frankfurt, covered by three regiments. They were out until the 14th when they returned with a good deal of forage. While British forces were out, Captain Richard Hovenden's loyalist troop of Philadelphia Light Dragoons and Captain William Thomas's company of Bucks County Volunteers pushed ahead and captured 25 prisoners. Nothing in the documents, however, suggests that Howe was concerned about the presence of over 1,200 Continentals across the school hall, all within striking range. As British foraging and woodcutting parties went out, the occupation continued. Few historians have devoted much attention to sustaining the armies. It's long past time that our gazes shift from the allure, the allure of battle to equally important matters of logistics. Historian Bowler has argued for the primacy of logistics in Britain's failure. David Sirrett has examined shipping, while Blake McGreedy and David Shung have called for the integration of environmental factors, including the search for sustenance in our understanding of the war. It is long past time to reconsider British strategy in Philadelphia. Thank you. That was a excellent start to the uh, the evening's uh, proceedings. Uh, I can see several questions have appeared. I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to take one slightly out of order and, and ask the one that Dudley posed first of all, simply sure. because for the uh, a quirk of the system, I can't actually make it appear as a question because uh, Dudley is one of the administrators. Uh, but he asks, uh, uh, did we, and by we, the, he means the British, uh, not learn anything from our foraging in Scotland during the 15 and 45 rebellions, or did we learn bad lessons? I, th I think uh, the, one of the things to, to keep in mind is, is the geographic proximity, certainly, of Scotland, but also the fact that when you consider Scotland, the, uh, the British Army had a fairly easy battle space to control. It's hemmed in by water. Where else will the, will the Scots go without a navy? In the, in the case of the Americans, you've got an extensive coastline, over a thousand miles of coastline that the Royal Navy has to patrol, but also the great difficulties with getting foodstuffs across the Atlantic and the weeks that it took to voyage. So what we see then is in the case of uh, the 15 and the 45, this ability, when driven back early on in the 15, the British Army is able to reconstitute, to regroup, and push forward. It's able to much more easily control the, those, um, those resources as well as the terrain, but also uh, to pursue the, uh, the Jacobites because of their constricted ge geographic spaces. So a variety of things are certainly working into this. That is, however, a, a good question that certainly needs further uh, examination. Ah, thank you. Um, next one then from, uh, from Philip. Uh, he asks, uh, is it possible to quantify how much the constant need to forage impacted on training? Uh, you know, that um, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure it did. One of the things that um, we see in terms of training is 
and I don't want to minimize this or make light of it, um, how it put, already put the Army through a, a, a rigorous training camp at Halifax shortly after departing Boston, I'm not altogether sure that very much training went on while the, gar while, uh, the Army garrisoned Philadelphia. I suppose that the actual marching out constituted a form of unintentional training, plus the regular uh, parades, the regular uh, emphasis on drill and ceremony, perhaps the wrong terms to use, those things all worked into factors in terms of keeping the army um, ready for combat. It wasn't so much a case of the, uh, the battalions or the, the, the regimental officers lacking, it's really a case of the needs of the army and its small size. This was primarily an expeditionary army that really could not operate terribly far from ports or waterways. It simply didn't have the strength in order to control the countryside that it needed. Thank you. Um, if I can follow on with that then, with a, 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 well, a series of questions actually, but I, sure. I, I, I think they're rather, they're rather nicely linked together because of opening up the comparisons a bit more from, uh, from Paul in the audience. Mm -hmm. he, he says, how did Howe's supplies difficulties <clears throat> compare to Washington's uh, and with other theatres during the war? Uh, was Howe's partic position particularly bad? Yeah. Um, I think if, if we if we measure out um, comparatively, the Continental Army's commissariat and quartermaster system was stumbling, decrepit, and you name it. <laughs> it rarely functioned very well. It did briefly for moments, but on the whole, it was not a terribly well uh, functioning system. And that in part is it was due to experience, but also due to ideology and the fear of creeping centralized power. This is something that continued and still continues in many ways in American politics. So the, the continental system never really functioned terribly well throughout the, throughout the war. That said, the British Army did, of course, suffer um, from want at times. And you'll see this in particular in the southern campaigns. Cornwallis's men, particularly in uh, 1780 and 81, when he decides to burn his baggage in order to try and pursue Green, uh, Nathaniel Green's army, which is much fleeter of foot. So uh, there, there, are, there were certainly circumstances where the British Army suffered, but on the whole, the British Army did have far better supply systems than the Continentals could have, uh, could have ever uh, put together. Uh, throughout the other theaters, you certainly see the, the American Army in 75 in its first incursion into Canada. It suffers terribly and it goes on and on. You see this uh, as a constant refrain in the American experience. As far as Howe's position being particularly bad, um, I, I take it you mean by being in Philadelphia. Uh, can, can you uh, clarify that one a little bit, Paul? Forgive me. I'm going to have to drop the question to, uh, okay. to get back and see if there's a, see if we can get sure. get the, uh, get the second part to it. Oh, me a moment. Um, there we go. Uh, just in terms of his position throughout the war, was the clarification there? Sorry, that's me. Uh, me getting confused with the uh, interface. Yeah. Well, um, I mean his. When he when he decides to uh, to descend on Philadelphia, he's he's got a um, he certainly has a problem. You've got the Delaware River, which uh, which Continental and and Pennsylvania forces had done a nice job uh, blocking with the with the with the forts on Mud Island as well as Red Bank, but also the uh, Chevaux de Frise that were uh, put in the river. Moreover, as um, Captain Andrew Snape Hammond, who commands the Royal Navy squadron on the river later testifies in 1779 to Parliament, this is one of the most difficult rivers he's ever navigated. The streams flow at two to four, even faster miles per hour. Um, ev virtually everywhere he commented, he was, he was within artillery range of enemy fire. So really a difficult position. Moreover, it took several months for the British to clear the obstacles in the river. So physically, yes, Howe was in a poor position there. It might have been better had he been somewhere closer to the coast, but still, 
it um it, it was this it was this need this desire this habit of uh, of mind uh, to have six month of, months of provisions on hand that drove quite a bit of his actions, his foraging. Right. If I could, uh, if I could stick with the uh, with the comparisons, then with a, a question from you. And um, he says, uh, was there a difference between the two sides with regard to them paying for supplies or taking them by force? Uh, and did that play out in terms of support from the local populace for either side? Oh yeah. Oh, a absolutely. Um, continental money was worthless. <laughs> And it got worse by the day. And with when you see when you when you when uh, when British forces seize Philadelphia, what they've done, besides seizing a political capital, is also seizing a major mid-Atlantic entrepot. So that Philadelphia had been a major port for grains. What this does is cut the Continentals off from their ability to set to sell goods to Europe in order to gain specie. So the, the fact that the British can offer gold or silver to farmers makes them far more attractive um, to con than, than continental foragers. You do see impressment, however, and you see this on both sides taking place. The continentals giving, uh, giving receipts for goods seized. The farmers, of course, not, they're, they're terribly opposed to it because they know how one, well, one, you're seizing my property. I don't care what cause it's going to. This is my property, damn it. Two, they realize that continental script is worthless. What takes place, and I don't want to get too far, far ahead of it, and if I can put in a shameless plug for my book, Feeding Washington's Army, which will come out in April of next year, foragers like Nathaniel Green get so frustrated when they find uh, farmers hiding their goods that Green then decides, we're simply going to seize your goods and not give you any receipts. So whereas you might have received a pittance, now it's less than a pittance. So the, the fact that payment, the, the uh, value of money, all of these things certainly works into the calculus of whether or not to supply the armies and which armies one would supply. You also have complaints even from um, people like Andrew Lesher, who's a county lieutenant, and he complains about Continentals coming in and seizing his firewood, seizing his cattle, um, basically, uh, preventing him from running his iron foundry, which is being used in support of the continental war effort. So this affects everyone and often seemingly indiscriminately. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've got two questions here from Ken, which uh, I think actually touch on, on the same. I'm, I'm going to put one of them up, but incorporate the other one as well. So uh, he, he asked, first of all, was any supply available from Canada? Uh, and then with respect to the uh, the figures that you were giving uh, regarding transatlantic supply, do, do they include the West Indies and, uh, and Canada? <laughs> um, no, no. Uh, Can Canada was actually, and uh, much to... Uh, to the King of France's uh, dismay before he lost uh, Canada. Canada was actually, uh, was actually a sponge that soaked up French money and it soaked up British money as well, given the short growing season. So it was, Canada was reliant to, to a large degree and I don't have the numbers at hand upon uh, imported supplies. As for the West Indies, actually um, before, the, um, before 1775, North Americans, uh, British North America, the, the mainland colonies, had actually been sending food southward into the West Indies to feed the, uh, the enslaved populations. So the West Indies really were not a source of supply for British, for British arms. What you see, though, is certainly within uh, the West Indies, places like uh, St. Eustatius, a, a Dutch colony, serving as a supply point for the Americans, but no food coming from the West Indies to feed either army. Lovely, thank you. That has got mm -hmm. to the end of, end, end of the uh, the questions and just nice and neatly to the end of the time as well. So that, oh, uh, that, that couldn't have gone better. Thank you very much indeed for uh, that contribution. I'm sure uh, uh, people will be showing their uh, appreciation in the uh, in the chat. But, uh, I know you, uh, you, need, you need to be somewhere uh, and an angry colonel to work with eight. So, uh, <laughs> well, we'll... I, I want to prevent it from being angry. Ah, well, be be better still, prevention better than cure. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you escape. Uh, and uh, if I could, uh, could ask uh, our second speaker, uh, Matt Kegel, to, uh, to join us on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Matt. Um, 
So Matt's going to be speaking to us tonight about the uh, the museum at, uh, at Fort Ticonderoga, where he uh, uh, is, is involved in the uh, uh, the display and the uh, uh, development of exhibits. Um, he personally is um, uh, a researcher of um, uh, 18th century uh, history with a uh, with a focus on military dress. Uh, but his uh, his paper tonight is going to talk about the uh, the collecting policy of the uh, the museum uh, more widely and its uh, it, its history across the uh, the years since its foundation. So, uh, thank you very much, Matt. I shall uh, I shall hand over to you and uh, we'll, uh, let, let's let's see your paper. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and it's a it's a pleasure to be invited here and to join colleagues on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, something I'm I'm quite interested in fostering, uh, and this is a good opportunity for me to do what I usually don't do, which is talk about the 18th century um, and actually talk a bit about how the 18th century was viewed uh, in the 20th century to a large part um, through the lens of Fort Ticonderoga here in the United States. And I think that sites of commemoration, of history, of memory are quite often very national in their origin and their execution and operation. Battlefields, for example, which often reinforce national struggles or sacrifices and virtues. But the site where I work at, Fort Ticonderoga in the United States, has long been the site of, I think, a tr consciously transatlantic history beyond just our own national history. And although this emphasis has waxed and waned over time, not only did the restoration and the development uh, of the museum at Ticonderoga predate many similar projects on our side of the Atlantic Ocean, but it was emphatically a process which linked the United States and Great Britain. So it's my intent over the course of this paper to explore to a certain extent in some small way how despite new approaches, new historical concerns, new methods of exhibition, our museum I think continues to foster a transatlantic sensibility that in fact is in many ways in keeping with our museum's founding over a century ago. And as the museum here at Ticonderoga developed, its founders were tapped into a community of British researchers due in no small part to the Society for Army Historical Research. In fact, the inaugural volume of the Journal of the Society featured as one of their commitments to publish, quote, extracts from rare and not easily accessible old military works a transcript simply entitled Ticonderoga 1758 by Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Butler. Now, in a number featuring just six main contributions, the inclusion of this account of a seven years war battle in North America, I think is significant. The battle at Ticonderoga represents one of the most stunning defeats suffered by the British army during that conflict and stands as the bloodiest battle fought on this continent until the American Civil War of the 1860s. Now, this also came at a time when Ticonderoga and its long history with the British military was drawing even greater attention due to events that were unfolding in America. Butler's introduction includes a reference to an article placed in the Royal United Services Institute Journal by an American named Stephen H. P. Pell. That article laid out a concise history of Fort Ticonderoga, originally known as Fort Carignan by the French, which was a key landscape uh, of warfare in North America and the object of at least four separate campaigns of the British forces there between 1758 and 1777. Pell, the author of this contribution, is cited rather grandly as, quote, the owner of the fort and surrounding works. This title, however, is no hyperbole. As Leatham noted in the Journal of the Society of Army Historical Research's first number, the society's creation had been postponed by the Great War. But Pell's piece was an acknowledgement that for nearly a half a decade, the site of Fort Ticonderoga had been undergoing a transformation. It had actually quietly been leading the field of historic preservation and restoration here in North America. Now, a little bit of background is in order. If you're unfamiliar with Fort Ticonderoga and its role in the 18th century, it had been built by the French beginning in 1755, known, as I mentioned, at Fort Carignan. Uh, it was the subject of repeated campaigns by the French and the British during the Seven Years' War until it finally fell in 1759. 
The bounds of what was the British garrison of Ticonderoga were delineated by General Geoffrey Amherst in 1759, following its capture. And the fort remained garrisoned by British forces for nearly 15 years from the point of its capture from the French and the beginning of the American War of Independence, when it featured prominently as the first offensive victory of the American rebels, falling uh, to those forces in May of 1775, less than a month after the commencement of hostilities. It was menaced by Sir Guy Carleton's army coming out of Canada in 1776, but not taken, and finally recaptured by the British under the command of General John Burgoyne in 1777. Now, following his surrender at Saratoga, the fort was largely abandoned, and the Royal Artillery destroyed much of what was left, so the Americans couldn't have anything, uh, and the fort was never fully reoccupied after November of 1777. Now, that being said, it continued to be passed by scouting parties and other detachments headed south. There was even a brief reoccupation by the British forces in 1781, but effectively, uh, the war ended at Ticonderoga in 1777. The garrison bounds that had been established by Amherst in 1759 were transferred to the United States government following the Treaty of Paris, which soon transferred them again to the U.S. state of New York, which by the early 19th century, in turn, ceded the property here to two colleges in the state of New York, effectively as a land trust. Now, not having done much with the property here at Ticonderoga, and the site was already attracting scavengers eager for souvenirs or for, frankly, building material in the terms of hewn stone that they could use to build structures up and down the lake, the colleges were ultimately convinced by 1820 to sell the garrison grounds of Fort Ticonderoga to a private citizen, this man, uh, William Ferris Pell, uh, an American merchant, who in fact, though, had been born in what was British-occupied New York in 1777 to parents who were loyalists still living in British-occupied New York, and set up a merchant business in Burlington, Vermont, on Lake Champlain, where Fort Ticonderoga sits, uh, and also in New York City. Now, by purchasing the site of Fort Ticonderoga and fencing in the area of the old citadel, Pell prevented the worst of the scavenging of the site, and whether knowingly or not, enacted perhaps the first historic preservation effort in American history. Unlike similar restorations, kind of patriotically driven uh, in Washington's headquarters in Newburgh, New York, or Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, Ticonderoga, I think, had a much broader historical appeal. Of course, built by the French, captured twice by the British, once by the Americans, and occupied by groups as diverse as Native American warriors and German auxiliaries, its story was more cosmopolitan than many historic sites, receiving uh, public attention in the US at the time. And Pell himself, from a family with a loyalist background, married to an Englishwoman named Mary Shipley, had a more complex background than more native uh, preservationists in this country. Uh, and of course, the site continued to be visited throughout the 1800s, as you can see here, the ruins of the barracks in the background. Now, following William Ferris Pell's death in 1840, the ruins of the fortification continued to be an historical attraction for Americans as well as foreigners, many of them making their way into the US from British Canada. Remember that Montreal in Quebec is only 150 miles to our north. And what you see here and in the previous photo were largely the condition of the site by the early 20th century. That is, until a fortuitous turn of events initiated the restoration of Fort Ticonderoga, one of the very first efforts of its kind in this country. Even this, however, proved to be a more international project than later and better known efforts in restoration here in the United States. Interest in creating a, a state or a national historic site had been floated here since at least the late 1800s, but the first serious thoughts at restoration and making this into a museum came not from a Pell family descendant, um, who still owned property here at Ticonderoga, nor even an American, but an English architect named Alfred Bossom. Bossom had been hired by an American newspaperman uh, to develop a summer estate who evidently had introduced him to the site of Ticonderoga, and Bossom's vision must have kind of run amok with ideas about what the restoration of these ruins uh, could accomplish. And uh, these are some of the renderings of Bossom's of what he anticipated restoring these ruins to their former glory would have looked like. Now, he may have been fueled by similar projects in Europe 
for instance, the, the reconstruction of the French fortress in Carcassonne in southern France, although research is still being conducted into his exact kind of background in historic restoration. He certainly wasn't an historic restoration architect. But despite all of his grand ideas about the restoration, he couldn't accomplish much because he didn't have the money to do it, even though he got the tacit permission of Pell family members uh, to do something if he could. Eventually, though, Bossom met Stephen and Sarah Pell, the descendants uh, of William Ferris Pell, who had purchased the property. And his interest, I think, found fertile ground amongst the Pells, uh, Sarah in particular. Uh, and through them, through their ownership of the property, and through the money from Sarah's family, they kicked off in 1908 the inaugural phase of the restoration of Fort Ticonderoga, beginning with the officers' barracks here. Now, you can see this uh, underway here. The idea was simply that you would take what was remaining of the fortifications and simply add the stone where it had fallen or been taken away to rebuild the structure. And that's exactly what they did over the course of 1908 to 1909. This structure, the restored officers' barracks at Ticonderoga, now the Museum of Fort Ticonderoga, was open to the public in 1909, the summer of 1909, as part of yet another international celebration, the tercentenary of Samuel de Champlain's exploration and so-called discovery of the lake that now bears his name. Now, in addition to the U.S. president, William Howard Taft, officials from Europe, including France and the United Kingdom, uh, in the form of Ambassador James Bryce, joined Bossom, Stephen, and Sarah, and under Bossom's direction, the reconstruction of the officers' barracks was consciously done towards an eye at replicating the Fort Ticonderoga, not that the French army knew, but that the British army knew, particularly the fort that General Amherst had captured and garrisoned. Now, Bossom even went so far as to seek reproduction roof tiles and flooring tiles from English manufacturers uh, to match exactly what was being found in the ruins of the fortification uh, as it was being reconstructed. Thus, by the time that Stephen Pell contributed his brief history of Ticonderoga to the Royal United Services Journal, he could justifiably be described as the owner of the fort and surrounding works. And his contribution as well as later submissions to the Journal for the Society of Army Historical Research, represents the Anglo-American nature of the project of Ticonderoga, forwarded by an English architect, supported by an American family with strong English and loyalist history. The developments of Ticonderoga very consciously looked across the Atlantic, as well as reflecting on the foundation of the United States. The research that was conducted to support the restoration, this is the original uh, opening uh, of Fort Ticonderoga early in the 20th century was undertaken by contacting the British Museum for maps and plans to inform the reconstruction of this structure. Beyond that documentary support, the, a material connection to Britain developed not just through the restoration itself, but the development and display of the museum's collection. And this began in many ways with the artifacts that were actually recovered from the ruins like this, frankly, somewhat striking English punch bowl base proclaiming success to General Amherst, reinforcing not just the military, but the commercial ties across the ocean that existed well back into the 18th century. Now, this material, archeological, we'd call it today, was quickly joined by artifacts that were consciously collected to illustrate military life and work from that era. And amongst the earliest was the armament of the fort's walls with historic artillery. Because, of course, if one is restoring a fort, one must provide the artillery that once peered forth from the embrasures. Now, Stephen's father-in-law, Sarah's father, was a Naval Academy graduate in the U.S. Uh, his name was Robert Means Thompson, and over his career, he had fostered a friendship with Admiral Lord Charles Beresford in the United Kingdom. And he approached him regarding the possibility of the British government having cannon that could be sent to Ticonderoga. Beresford appealed to Secretary of State for War Haldane in 1910 on behalf of his American friend, and the following year, Ambassador Bryce at the British Embassy in America reported that Ticonderoga's request, quote, is one in which they, the British War Department, ought to render you sympathy and help. And eventually, 14 blown field pattern 24 pounders were discovered at Woolwich that could be disposed of for the princely sum of six pounds sterling apiece not including shipping to the United States. And although Sarah Pell 
uh, was in England and corresponding over the shipment of these guns. The ultimate transfer was delayed somewhat in 1911 due to the coronation of George V. But where the U.S. government, who was also approached about finding cannon for Ticonderoga, responded unenthusiastically that it would be unlikely to find artillery for this project, the British government came through and these 14 cannon were installed here at Ticonderoga, where they have sat ever since as the beginning of what has become the largest private collection of 18th century artillery in the Western Hemisphere. Now, in addition to museum pieces, the very landscape itself was being informed by Britain. Although the fort was a publicly accessible museum, the broader site remained the Pell family's private estate. And in English country estate fashion, a gatekeeper's cottage was built, drawing cues from the architecture of the fort itself. And the Pells seized upon the opportunity in the 1910s to acquire the early 18th century iron gates of Burley House in Enfield that was being demolished in 1913. And Sarah Pell, who was once again in England at the time, organized their purchase and shipment to the United States, where they were installed directly at the then entrance to the site, near the gatekeeper's cottage, giving an air of old world grandeur and pedigree to this historic site by 1914. So thus, once again, by the time of Stephen Pell's submission to the Royal United Services Journal, and the inclusion of the account of Ticonderoga in the Journal for the Society of Army Historical Research, Ticonderoga had emerged as a substantial, if private, transatlantic project. And the press in Great Britain even reported on the progress. Um, this 1923 piece in the illustrated newspaper, The Graphic, is titled Britain's American Citadel. And the article goes on to affirm that despite being the site of direct conflict, between America and Great Britain, this project restored, quote, a new bond of friendship between the countries, mentioning details like the bricks and the cannon that had come across the Atlantic. Similarly, a contemporary travel article entitled An English Woman at Ticonderoga further played down the site's history as a place of Anglo-American conflict, explicitly stating that after the Great War, the American Revolution was seen more as an American struggle against a German king and his Hessian minions rather than against the British people. Throughout the first decades of the museum's history in the 19 aughts, 10s, and 20s, the site be became seen as a place where the enemies of the past, at least the French, the British, and the Americans, could reflect on their violent histories in the context of their current friendship and alliance especially in the wake of the Great War. By the 1930s, the New Yorker magazine here described Ticonderoga as the finest collection of Indian and Revolutionary War relics in the country. And this was due to the dogged pursuit of artifacts from the colonial period, much of which reflected the service of British forces at Ticonderoga, including this striking gold pendant containing a lock of William Augustus Lord Howe's hair, who was famously killed near Ticonderoga in the summer of 1758 and which had been preserved by the chaplain of Howe's regiment, the 55th Regiment of Foot. Now, while this focus, or this collecting rather, focused especially on the British experience at Ticonderoga, the museum continued to incorporate material not only related to British service in North America more broadly, but even beyond that to the broader Atlantic world. Stephen here, in one of my favorite photographs of him, uh, is seen strutting across the parade ground of the restored fort, carrying a 1742 pattern long land service musket marked to the 47th Regiment of Foot, which may have seen service under Wolfe at Quebec. And this exchange of artifacts actually worked both ways. So, for example, in 1932, Fort Ticonderoga donated an early Scottish ensign it had acquired to the old Scottish Naval and Military Museum, and it still resides in the National War Museum for Scotland in Edinburgh. A pair of Belford pattern six-pounders uh, engraved to the Royal Bucks King's Own Militia were acquired from the auction of the contents of Stowe House in 1921, and Stephen Pell used the reach of the Journal for the Society of Army Historical Research to inquire amongst its readership to provide context to this new acquisition to the collection in 1925. Now, throughout this time, the Fort Ticonderoga Museum, largely through Stephen Pell himself, who appears here later in life, um, contributed, I think, to a transatlantic discourse in military history in the terms of the early 20th century. 
Stephen made readers of the Journal for the Society of Army Historical Research aware of a range of artillery projectiles that had been recovered at the site in the January 1924 number, promoting the piece in or pro promoting Fort Ticonderoga in another history in the April 1928 number of the journal. He informed the readership that they might find quote perhaps the most interesting military museum of its period in the country, and shortly after the creation of the Journal of the Society of uh, Army Historical Research, Fort Ticonderoga began its own publication, which was in turn reviewed by the journal uh, in Great Britain in 1927. And it continued to be cited as, quote, full of material of interest to the readership and membership of the Society for Army Historical Research. Now, originally housed in the reconstructed barracks that I showed you earlier, British artifacts in the collection were rather haphazardly displayed alongside artifacts from many other nations in exhibits that perpetuated a, a rather overwhelming exhibition style. As the reconstruction of the museum continued over the course of the 1930s and 40s especially, uh, to include more ramparts, outworks of the fort, etc., as well as barracks, the exhibitions expanded as well. They became more modern, but only just. They were still rather crowded, lacking much interpretation. And Stephen's death in 1950, the rise of domestic tourism after the Second World War, and especially, I think, the bicentennial of the American War of Independence diminished some of the international character of the museum. Now, the charge of the Black Watch, the Highland Regiment in 1758, or the crafty placement by British artillerymen of cannon on Mount Defiance overlooking Ticonderoga in 1777 were still key elements of the site's story. And the museum still relied on British authorities, many of whom would be familiar to readers of the Journal for the Society of Army Historical Research, including Cecil C.P. Lawson, Adrian Caruana, or Ian Beckett, who examined, verified, and published pieces from our collection. But Ticonderoga's story in the 20th century, later 20th century at least, was becoming much more about the United States than the early 20th century's shared story of nation, nations evolving from antagonists into allies. And today, the museum has in some ways, I think, leaned back into our transatlantic history, especially as we have increasingly re-emphasized our collections, as well as recent trends in scholarship that emphasize the broader Atlantic community. Changes in the museum's leadership in only the last decade or so have caused us to take stock of what we have here. Not only is the collection quite broad, going well beyond the period in which the fort even existed, take for example this uh, pre-ordnance system Queen Anne Firelock, um, to a period well after the fort was in use. So for example, on the right, this uh, British officer's coatee of the 49th Regiment of Foot from the Anglo-American War of 1812. But specific objects allow us into the experiences of soldiers whose lives and careers crossed the Atlantic Ocean even in the 18th century, like this uh, other uniform here, a major general's great uniform uh, from a British officer living as a half-pay major general in New York City towards the end of the 18th century. This attention to the origin of artifacts and by extension individuals had allowed, has allowed us to begin to recover the complex way that the Atlantic community waged wars across the 18th century, particularly those that were best known for. And by exploring this context and significance, Ticonderoga's own story comes into perspective. Um, observing and understanding artifacts can lead to conversations as divergent as the consolidation of the British state and the settlement of the American colonies that led to the War of Independence through the lens of a Scottish officer serving uh, in the conflicts here or the evolution of the ordnance system of manufacture in Britain and Ireland that armed British troops and its role in informing American industrial development during and after the American War of Independence. These allow tangible objects to ground narratives that go beyond the physical walls of the fort itself. We do that also through exhibits, such as exploring the life cycle of our artillery, where we can look at the experiences of gun founders through their creations that form part of this collection, rather than simply as set dressing to the fort itself as they had been treated early in the 20th century. Or similarly, a, a recent exhibition opened just this year uses our Buckinghamshire canon that Stephen Pell wrote to the Society Journal about and which Society contributor Ian Beckett later analyzed more carefully to contrast the experience of citizen soldiers across the Atlantic as part of an exhibit exploring the institution of the militia here in the United States, which owes a great deal in fact 
to the conception and execution of the militia in Britain. All of these themes are brought to life through the interpretive program here at Fort Ticonderoga, which uses in costumed interpretation to portray a different year of the site's history each year, allowing us to focus on the experience and often the collision of different nations, regiments, and military cultures. So although physically grounded in the United States, Fort Ticonderoga's history and collections are inextricably linked to the broader evolution of the museum world across the Atlantic Ocean. This broader perspective of Ticonderoga, which forces an examination of French and continental European, as well as Native American military practice, compels us to reflect on the complex interactions of peoples that have shaped our world today. And by contextualizing the events and artifacts here within this broader community, we gain greater perspective on our own history, and I hope are able to contribute to other nations' understanding of themselves and their own international relationships. And in doing so, we're excited to find that as we reach out to students, educators, colleagues, and the public, we're in some ways furthering a foundational part of our institution supporting a shared vision of history that crosses international boundaries that we are excited to foster into our, as well as the Society for Army Historical Research's next century. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, that. That was excellent. Uh, I, I think, judging by the uh, the comments in the in the public chat, we're, we're all coming to visit as soon as we can. So uh, you've, uh, <laughs> you, you, you've you've sold the site wonderfully. Um, I'll. Uh, I think we only have one question. Uh, I, I did let you go on slightly long because I couldn't see many coming up, but uh, we'll uh, we'll have the one now and see if any more appear while while, while you're answering it. And it's uh, it, it's a rather mercenary one, I'm afraid. The question. Uh, <laughs> from you and is uh, how does your site compare with civil war sites for national funding yeah that's a it's an interesting question because fort ticonderoga uh was established privately basically as the enterprise of a, of a private citizens um it was incorporated as a not-for-profit uh museum in the 1930s and we remain an independent not-for-profit historic site to this day which means that we are not part of the National Park Service here in the United States. We are not part of the, um, the state of New York's uh, state historic site system. So we do not receive regular funding the way that those sites would, or the way, as I understand it, many of the sites in, in European nations would directly from a national government. Um, that being said, um, the museum supports itself not only through private donation and admissions, um, but also uh, various grants from the national government to do various projects. And we're in, involved in, in more than a few right now, uh, both to catalog our, our own collection here. And um, if any of you visit the uh, Fort Ticonderoga Museum website, um, you will uh, be able to navigate to our online collections database, which has over 8,000 artifacts in it right now and is growing almost weekly as we add material. So always check back. Um, and a lot of that work was done through a national grant, but we receive um, no regular funding from the national government because we remain a, a private not-for-profit historic site. Ah, thank you. All the more, uh, all the more creditable in that case. Um, that does seem to be it for the questions, I'm afraid. So you, 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 clearly, you clearly satisfied everybody with the uh, with with the talk, and uh, uh, nobody has anything uh, left to puzzle them. Uh, that being so, I, I, I would thank you again very much, and uh, I, I'm sure I can see from the uh, from the chat again you've got you're getting plenty of, uh, of rounds of applause coming around. So uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, We'll, uh, we'll we'll take a short break now. Um, just if if it, uh, uh, want to take a comfort break, um, it's uh, it's six minutes to by uh, by my clock. Uh, I, I suggest to keep things nice and neat. We we don't waste too much time. We we, we start the next panel on the hour. So uh, I'm going to disappear for five minutes or so, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll pick things up. At uh, at eight o'clock British time, and uh, and carry on with the second two papers. So uh, don't go away, and uh, do amuse yourself in the chat in the mean space.
Hello again, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you're uh, you're all uh, refreshed and ready for the uh, the second half of uh, this evening's proceedings. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to stay uh, on the uh, the western side of the Atlantic uh, for the uh, the first of these papers, but we're uh, we're moving on into the uh, the nineteenth century now and uh, uh, a little way north. So. Uh, if I could ask him to join us uh, on the stage, our uh, our next speaker is Paul McNichol. Um, welcome, Paul. Uh, Paul is uh, is joining us from uh, from Vancouver Island. Uh, I, I think makes him the the, uh, the westernmost speaker of the uh, the entire program. Um, he he's now retired and he's uh, using that retirement to. Uh, uh, indulge his study of, uh, of military history. He's uh, he's going to be speaking to us uh, tonight uh, about the uh, the Red River expedition uh, on which he's published a history, uh, and he's currently working on uh, on not one but two uh, books. Uh, with the uh, benefits of, uh, of plenty of time in uh, in retirement. Uh, one of those on uh, Canada in the Boer War, uh, and the other on uh, Donald Montgomery. Uh, brother of the uh, the field marshal, but as I say tonight, we're going to be hearing about the uh, the Red River expedition. So I will uh, I will hand over uh, uh, and let him tell us all about that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, the title of my presentation tonight is the Red River Expeditionary Force of 1870: British Regulars and Canadian Volunteers Crossing the Canadian Shield. Uh, let's begin by looking at a couple of maps uh, for the context of the Red River story. The Dominion of Canada had come into existence in 1867 and consisted of what we would know today as the southern parts of the provinces of Quebec and Ontario, as well as Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and these can be seen in the left-hand map. Most of what would become the Canadian West in, 18, in 1870 was territory loosely administered by the Hudson's Bay Company. Canada at the beginning of 1870 can be seen in the right-hand bottom corner of the map on the right. All the rest of the lighter shaded area was the HBC land that Canada was seeking to acquire. The largest community in the HBC lands was the Red River Settlement, and Upper Fort Garry was the headquarters of the HBC in the Northwest, and it was located in the heart of the settlement. It was the prospect of Canadian acquisition that triggered the unrest, which led to the dispatch of the, of the expeditionary force. The Métis, the French-speaking people of mixed ethnicity, who made up just over 48% of the settlement's population, feared that their land ownership and culture were threatened. When assurances from Canada did not arrive, under the leadership of Louis Riel, the Métis took matters into their own hands. In fact, a political settlement was achieved, with the result being the Manitoba Act, which was to come into effect on July 15, 1870. At the beginning of March, however, Rial sanctioned the execution of an English-speaking prisoner at Upper Fort Garry by the name of Thomas Scott. There was outrage in Ontario, and regardless of the political settlement, this resulted in an outcry for the dispatch of a military force to avenge his death. It was inevitable that Canada would send a garrison to the West for the establishment of law and order and the defense of its new empire. Once he became aware of the events at the settlement, however, Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald began to contemplate its early dispatch. But Canada lacked the expertise to carry this out alone and British organizational assistance uh, and participation would be essential. However, at the beginning of 1870, the British government of William Gladstone announced that other than at Halifax, the British garrison would be withdrawn from Canada by the end of the year. With reluctance, it was agreed that a small British force would accompany a larger Canadian one to Upper Fort Garry. 
but as viewed by Gladstone and, and Colonial Secretary Lord Granville, this was not going to be a punitive expedition. Also, participation would in no way change the timetable of withdrawal. Given the limiting factor of the severe winter climate of the North American interior, a round trip by British troops to the Red River settlement in a single season was an ambitious proposition. With the garrison's removal pending, the senior British Army officer in Canada was now based in Halifax rather than Montreal. But in light of the decision to commit troops to the expedition and with the timetable for the withdrawal of the garrison always paramount, the war office in London became uneasy at not having a senior officer closer to the center of events. Therefore, Lieutenant General James Lindsay was sent from England to take charge at Montreal. He arrived on April 4th. He was hard driving, not afraid to rustle feathers, and is in many ways the forgotten architect of the Red River expedition. Colonel Garnet Wolseley, the officer who would command the force, had recently been appointed Deputy Quartermaster General. At 34 years of age, he was the youngest officer in Canada to have been appointed to this senior staff position. A supporter of practical training and army reform, he was detail-oriented, ambitious, and extremely competent. In 1870, there was no easy way to reach the Red River settlement from Canada. The best routes and transportation modes were south of the Great Lakes through the U.S. And Washington expected the British and Canadians to seek permission to access its territory to move its men to the west. As the U.S. also aspired to take control of the HBC lands, it had been determined that the response would be a firm refuse refusal. But the British planners never contemplated requesting access through U.S. territory. They selected the old, Northwest uh, the old Northwest Company Canoe Highway from Thunder Bay on Lake Superior with the Kaministiquia River as its starting point. The Northwest Company had been merged with the HBC in 1821, and the route had largely fallen into disuse. The advantages were the ice-free window on Lake Superior was longer than that on Hudson's Bay. The advent of steamships on the Great Lakes meant access to, to Thunder Bay was easier than in the days of the Northwest Company. And there was a road under construction from Thunder Bay to Shevendowan Lake. Once the force reached Shevendowan Lake, it was going to be a journey across the lakes, rivers, and portages of the Canadian Shield. 135 boats were constructed, along with two canoes and a gig. However, the chosen route had never before been used by such a large body of men or seen boats of this size. The expedition would travel a total of 1,228 miles, 94 by rail from Toronto to Collingwood, 534 by steamer from Collingwood to Thunder Bay, 50 from Thunder Bay to Shebendowan Lake along the road, and 550 by boat from Shevendowan Lake to Upper Fort Garry. The British designated the 1st Battalion of the King's Royal Rifle Corps and the 60th Rifles as their infantry component. When Lindsay arrived, he was annoyed to discover that nothing had been done to raise the Canadian contingent. He suggested sending the Royal Canadian Rifles a regiment of the British Army permanently stationed in Canada. They were trained and, re and they were ready to go. This was rejected by the Department of Militia, which had decided to raise two battalions of volunteers, one from the active militia regiments of Ontario and one from those in, in Quebec. Due to Scott's execution, there was no shortage of volunteers in Ontario. Quebec was a different story and Lindsay eventually lost patience. He selected 120 men from the Royal Canadian Rifles and recruited the rest in Ontario. The expedition would consist of approximately 1,200 men made up of three battalions of infantry, comprising seven companies each, as well as a Royal Artillery contingent with four seven-pounder brass guns and detachments from the Royal Engineers, the Army Service Corps, and the Army Hospital Corps. 
There were also around 400 boatmen and guides hired by the Canadian Public Works Department. The Canadian government took responsibility for chartering the Great Lakes steamers required to transport the force and its supplies from Collingwood to Thunder Bay. Seeming inaction again caused Lindsay to lose patience, and he arranged terms with the owners of five ships. In fact, Canada had, had hired one and possibly two steamers, but under a veil of secrecy. This was probably aimed at the Americans, though Lindsay and Wolseley were also kept in the dark, which was far from helpful, and one or two ships were never going to be enough. At Sault Ste. Marie, where the St. Mary's River drops 23 feet between Lake Superior and Huron, the Americans had constructed a canal. Surprisingly, Lindsay and Wolseley made the assumption that the U.S. authorities would allow its use by the expedition. The U.S. Secretary of State had even informed the British minister in Washington that the canal would be closed to a military expedition, but this rather important piece of intelligence was seemingly not communicated, which was also far from helpful. The canal issue was fairly quickly resolved. However, Wolseley would later claim that these two events, the steamers and the canal, delayed his departure, and he laid the blame squarely at the feet of Canadian authorities. In fact, Wolseley did not mention either until July, when he was stuck on the road from Thunder Bay to Shevendown Lake. So let's give some consideration to the road as it became the biggest controversy of the expedition's journey. It was to cover a distance of almost 50 miles, and as Shebendown Lake sits 839 feet above Thunder Bay, it was expected to be a considerable time saving, a saving of time and effort as the expedition would be able to bypass the difficult rapids and falls of the Cam River. The simple fact of the matter, however, was that the road was not going to be ready when the expeditionary force arrived. Lindsay and Wolseley knew this, though just how unready it actually was probably came as something of a shock. There is no question that the road was a delaying factor. The leading elements of the expedition began landing at Thunder Bay on May 25th. The first troops did not set out on Shebendown Lake until July 16th. Once finally embarked, the expedition traveled in self-contained boat brigades of typically six boats each. The term boat brigade was a holdover from the heyday of the fur trade. The force would not move as a compact mass and was spread, over, spread out over as much as 150 miles. There was one guide for each brigade and each boat had two boatmen. Wolseley was critical of many of these he had, he had nothing but praise, however, for the Iroquois boatmen recruited near the villages, from villages near Montreal. Three boat brigades together with, the, with two of the expedition's guns set out on the 16th. The other two guns were left behind at a fort constructed on Thunder Bay. Other, great, other brigades would depart at intervals over the next two plus weeks. The King's Royal Rifle Corps, the Royal Artillery, and the Royal Engineers led the way. The first of the Ontario Rifles left on July 21st, and the first of the Quebec Rifles on August 1st. Wolseley made sure he had sufficient strength in the vanguard in case he ran into trouble. If anyone wanted to lay ambush, the country was perfect for it. Potential opponents were seen as being the Aboriginal peoples in the path of the expedition, the Fenians, Irish-American veterans of the Civil War who'd been launching raids from the U.S. into Canada for a number of years, and the Métis. In fact, there would be no opposition from the first two, and I'll discuss the prospect of Métis opposition when the expedition nears the end of its journey. Wolseley decreed that no spirits would be consumed during the trek. The troops drank tea and their health remained remarkably robust. Rations provided the required nutrition, but quickly became monotonous. One officer described them as choke dock. 
The weight of cargo in each boat ranged from three to 4,000 pounds. The boats were in fact so heavily laden that the rowers struggled to find places for their feet. There were 47 portages varying in length from 100 yards to over a mile. Everything had to be carried over the difficult terrain. Salted, salted pork half barrels weighed 200 pounds, flour barrels 120, and biscuit barrels 100. One officer recorded that he became proficient at carrying two to 250 pound loads and some of the indigenous boatmen carried three to 400 pound loads. Late in the expedition, one boatman was noted to have carried a weight of 528 pounds. When the rapids were too rough to run the boats through, they were hauled over as well, and they were not lightly constructed craft. Then there were the insects. Mosquito oil was largely useless, and in his darkened tent, one officer doused himself in what he thought was mosquito oil only to find in the morning that the bottle next to him contained sauce. The indigenous boatmen rubbed the, expo the exposed parts of their bodies with pork fat. The troops would eventually emulate this. During the 94 days uh, between the first landing of the first British troops at Thunder Bay and the arrival of the British battalion at Upper Fort Garry, it rained, sometimes torrentially, on 45 of them. The men were constantly wet, either from the rain or their frequent plunges into the water. Their clothes began to wear out. The lead brigade reached Fort Francis, about 225 miles from Shebendown Lake, on August 4th. The troops did not stop, but Wolseley remained for a few days. Fort Francis was to become an advanced base, and he wanted to ensure it was established to his satisfaction. One company of the Ontario Rifles remained as a garrison. The leading boats were able to unfurl their sails on Lake of the Woods and fly across to Rat Portage. By the time Wolseley arrived, a storm had blown in and he was forced to take shelter on an island. After two days, against the advice of his Iroquois boatmen, he set off without a guide in the gig. He became lost and alarm bells were ringing when he finally made his way into Rat Portage guided by an indigenous family. The next stage of the journey down the Winnipeg River to Fort Alexander was the most challenging of the entire trip. Over 163 miles, the river dropped 349 feet. One expedition member reported that it was fortunate that Winnipeg was undertaken near the end of the journey after the, main, after the men had gained skill in boat handling, though the indispensability of the Iroquois boatmen was proved yet again. All the British troops had reached Fort Alexander near Lake Winnipeg by August 18th. Wolseley arrived two days later. Traveling by canoe, his party passed through the two leading Canadian boat brigades struggling down the river. So what was going through Wolseley's mind with his goal almost in sight? He would later write of the urgency of reaching the settlement due to letters from the English speaking residents calling on him to make haste. As a highly competent professional leading his first independent command and anxious to make an impression, he was going to be ready for all eventualities right up to the end of the mission. This was only natural for a soldier of his stature. But if we take Wolseley's later writings at face value, in spite of a political settlement having been agreed before he set out, and the fact that his orders were quite clear that he was not leading a punitive expedition, the nearer he got to Fort Garry, the more he appears to have been spoiling for a fight. There is, however, absolutely no evidence that Riel and the Métis ever intended to oppose the arrival of his force. And if Wolseley truly did believe that a battle awaited him at Fort Garry, why, didn't he, why did he not allow the two nearby Canadian brigades to catch up? He set off from Fort Alexander on the afternoon of August 21st with just the British contingent, though moving when he did would prove to be a wise decision insofar as the weather was concerned. A fierce storm was about to blow in that would delay the Canadians. <laughs> 
A fair wind, however, greeted Wolseley's flotilla on Lake Winnipeg. They spent the night on Elk Island and were consumed, were consumed by the resident insect life. The following morning, they entered the Red River. Wolseley hoped to reach Lower Fort Garry before nightfall, but was still 12 miles short when he ordered a halt. Next morning, August 23rd, they breakfasted at the Lower Fort. The boats were lightened to four days of provisions. The upper fort was 21 and a half miles away by road. All who left an account speak of the triumphal reception received as they passed through the settlement's English-speaking parishes. By nightfall, they were still six miles short of their goal, and the weather had turned decidedly nasty. The troops spent an uncomfortable night in the driving rain. Anybody who ventured out from the direction of the upper fort was obliged to remain with them. Wolseley was determined that the secrecy of his presence would be maintained. The following morning, two miles from the upper fort, the expedition landed and in battle order made its final approach. There was no opposition, and as, as has already been stated, there was no evidence to suggest this was ever contemplated. Upper Fort Garry was occupied on the morning of August 24th. Riel's breakfast was found on the table, but the Métis leader and his immediate followers, possibly having received word of the expedition's mood, wisely decided to withdraw. The first of the Canadian troops arrived on August 27th. The first of the British troops began their, began their return trek on August 29th. By October, all were barracked in Quebec, awaiting their departure from Canada. Wolseley left the Red River settlement on September 10th. He'd been at Fort Garry for just 18 days. Lindsay was returning to England and sent word suggesting they travel on the same ship. Wolseley passed through Toronto without stopping and left Canada at the beginning of October. He never returned to the country where he had served for the better part of a decade. The Canadian contingent remained and became the garrison of Canada's new empire. The period that followed would see the opening of the West to European immigration and the end of the way of life for a great many of the region's original inhabitants. There were also acts of vengeance committed by some of the Canadians against the Métis. Viewed as an example of a British military expedition of the mid-Victorian period, the journey of the Red River Expeditionary Force, despite a few hiccups, was a planning and logistical masterpiece. To take a force of over 1,200 men into the wilderness, across a largely disused and forgotten route that had never previously seen such a large body of men, was a significant accomplishment and set Wolseley on the way to the top of his profession. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It was, uh, it was another fascinating uh, presentation. Um, if I could throw a few questions at you, then uh, the first one from uh, from Dudley, which means again I can't put it up on the on the screen. But j just to clarify a point, which, which I, I confess I lost slightly as well. H how was the issue with the uh, the Sussamari Canal resolved and the Americans? How, did did they get through or did they go round? They got through. Um, the it's interesting in that. Um, they they were unsure where the direction for the closure had come from. It had, it had pretty clearly come from Washington, uh, because which is interesting given uh, the uh, intelligence that the British minister in Washington had, and, and why it appears that he never he never passed this along. Um, they they the British initially approached the local authorities. Uh, and were just told that there was nothing they could do. So ultimately, the minister went back to uh, the Secretary of State in Washington, D.C., and um, through a combination of uh, explanation that uh, an, a political agreement had been reached with the people at the Red River Settlement, uh, but also a bit of a threat that... Uh, a canal, another canal on the Great Lakes that was in Canadian hands uh, could be possibly close to American shipping. The Americans opened the Sault Ste. Marie Canal. The uh, reality, uh, the reality is uh, the closure of it would have delayed the British 
but it wouldn't have prevented them. They'd already managed to get one ship onto the onto the upper lake, Lake Superior. They hired a second American ship where the captain lied about the purpose of his transit onto the upper lake uh, in support of the ship. So they could have got it done. The Americans imposed certain conditions. Uh, no troops or material could be could be on the ships when they pass through the canal. But that was that would that was a delaying factor, but it wasn't going to stop the expedition. Great, thank you. No, that that, that clears that up nicely. Um, a, a couple of link questions here. I'll I'll put the first one up from uh, from you. And um, he asks, uh, were there differences in quality and or discipline between the British regulars and the Canadian volunteers? Uh, and if so, what were their effects? Well, I mean, the init initially the the Canadians uh, were members of the active militia, so they would have had some training. Uh, but not to the extent of the British regulars. At this time, uh, the, um, the Canadian militia relied very heavily on the British garrison, which was, uh, so the loss of the garrison was going to be, to have a fairly significant impact on the development of the Canadian militia. Uh, so the Canadians were not as well trained. Uh, and the fact that they had to, that the, that the men were pulled from a variety of different active militia regiments uh, certainly resulted in a period of time being taken up. I mean, just for the fact that these men would have to get used to the, to their off the officers that they were now serving under and the men that they were serving with. So there was a delay there. But at the end of the expedition, Wolseley played paid glowing praise to both the British regulars and the Canadian militia and essentially said that they they brought different skill sets uh, to the enterprise but by the end of it they were they were as equally as good as each other uh, he spoke in particular to sort of the fact that the Canadians um, uh, sort of were compared to to the the uh, rankers uh, in the British force, they were they came from a more educated background. They had more lateral thinking skills, I guess, is what he would be saying. Uh, but and so they brought their own piece to the expedition. He was quite glowing in their in his praise for them. I will add too that uh, they wore the same uniforms. Bo both uh, the Canadians were kitted out in rifle red regiment uniforms. And it was decreed that the Canadians and the British would earn the same rates of pay during the expedition, which meant an increase in pay for the British forces. Uh, just following that up then with a, a linked question, and I'm sorry, it, my machine is freezing up for me. I can't get this one to come up, but uh, uh, Philip asks, uh, uh, he's always wanted to have in his possession a Canada General Service Medal with Red River 1870 made out to the 60th, but there are very few of them, uh, less than 150. Uh, does this indicate a greater burden being placed on the uh, on the militia? Well, there were two, keep in mind, there were two Canadian regiments uh, for each, for uh, compared to the one British regiment. The, the British force was, the British infantry force was roughly 350 in strength and the Canadians about the same. So in, in terms of infantry, it was two thirds Canadians to one third British. I mean, the British also had the engineers, Royal Engineers, the Royal Artillery and so forth. Um, but uh, yes, they are few and far between. I'm not a metal collector myself, but I just happened the other day to be in a, a store in Victoria. Uh, and I just and I asked the fellow in the store about how often they come up. And he said the general service medals come up relatively frequently, but not the Red River class. Right, which would be the uh, the important detail, of course. Uh, one very specific one uh, from Simon, who, who simply asks, uh, how many casualties were there during the uh, the expedition? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, the, in fact, uh, the Americans, the advice that they were getting, because as I mentioned, they were they aspired to uh, take control of the Red River of the Hudson's Bay Company lands themselves. The information they were receiving from uh, American citizens at the settlement was that just hold tight because the British and the Canadians will never be able to get a large, a large enough military force uh, from Canada to the West. Uh, 
there will be massive numbers of casualties uh, on the journey. There was uh, one thing I didn't touch upon tonight because 20 minutes is a limited time to time frame to try and cover the story. Uh, the the uh, Wolseley had sent a, um, a special intelligence officer through the United States uh, who actually passed through the Red River settlement and had a meeting with Real on the way and then made his way up and met the expedition uh, as it was making its way to Fort Garry. Um, and while in the United States, he was reading American newspapers that were talking about massive numbers of casualties, uh, you know, and bodies of soldiers washing up in in, uh, in various cataracts and waterfalls, of course, all untrue. The story that has been told is that there were there were no casualties uh, in the expedition. Uh, if anybody knows anything about it, it's usually that there were no casualties. Uh, which, going back very briefly to the medal, would make it the only medal ever issued to uh, uh, for, a Brit for a British military operation where there were no casualties. In fact, go when I was researching the book, going through uh, the diaries of some of the uh, people who took who participated, I did find reference to uh, an accident. Uh, where a, a pistol was thrown from one of the boats during the portage. It was dropped, it hit the rock, it discharged and struck one of the Canadian militia members in the chest. Uh, he was in a very bad way. He was going to be left behind at one of the portages with some, with, with some care. But I would suspect, I, never, I was never able to find out anything more about him. Given a wound of that magnitude in the middle of nowhere, I suspect there was one fatal casualty on the expedition. Thank you. Uh, we're doing rather well. We managed to have got to the uh, the end of the questions and the end of the time slot just uh, pretty much simultaneously again. So uh, it only remains in that case for me to thank you very much for uh, a fascinating paper. My and, pleasure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure if I could see the public chat, there'd be uh, there'd be rounds of applause going on in there as well. It's the uh, the curse of this impersonal system that uh, you don't get to hear the. Uh, the clapping, but I, I can. I, yes, it's definitely there. You're you're getting a a, a rapturous uh, ovation. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And uh, if I could uh, ask you now to make way for our our final speaker, uh, and we'll move on to the last paper of the uh, the evening. So we've. We're sticking with the presenter from uh, across the Atlantic, but the uh, the the topic is moving back across uh, to. Uh, to European uh, matters, if uh, if I can ask Luke Reynolds to uh, to join me now on the uh, on the stage. Welcome, Luke. Uh, Luke is uh, going to be talking to us tonight about the uh, the interplay between uh, fashion and uh, and satire in the uh, the aftermath of Waterloo. Um, he's written extensively uh, on uh, on these topics for the uh, the Journal of Victorian Culture and the Journal of Tourism in History. Uh, and he's very pleased to tell us that his, uh, his first book uh, to be entitled Who Owned Waterloo? Battle, Memory and Myth in British History uh, is due to be published in, uh, in June of next year uh, by Oxford University Press. So we're, uh, we're lucky tonight to get a, a sneak preview uh, of what's hopefully going to be the, uh, the contents of that. So uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll disappear and I'll let you get on with the last paper of the day. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you to the Society for uh, putting this together. Um, it seems about two years when I sent in this, this two years ago that I sent in this um, this abstract, but it, it seems to have worked out pretty well. All right. Uh, first of all, I apologize in advance for the ridiculous lisp I'm about to put on for one block quote in the introduction. In 1818, the Literary Gazette Society writer Felix McDonough visited the wildly popular panorama of Waterloo at Henry Aston Baker's, uh, Barker's Rotunda in Leicester Square. In his debut detailed report, not just of the panorama itself, but of the crowds that flocked to it, McDonough identified five military archetypes that could be found at the entertainment. These were uh, the old general, the silent military spectator, the garrulous but worthy disabled veteran, the helpful officer who acted as a volunteer guide, and finally, the exquisite militaire. This last, according to McDonough, was a fop, youthful and blooming, affected and vain, lounging with an air of sans souci, a toothpick or a violet in his mouth, a quizzing glass, either suspended round his neck, 
or fixed in the socket of his eye, seeming to disdain taking an interest in the thing, yet lisping out, Upon my foal, it's damned like, damned like indeed. Yes, that is just the place where we lost so many men. It's quite ridiculous how like it it is. What a contrast, McDonough concluded. So much valor, yet so much feminine conceit, starch and perfume, whalebone and pasteboard. None of this would have been particularly shocking to the literary Gazette's readers. Thanks to a military and political establishment who recognized the power of uniforms when it came to preserving order, the poor behavior of certain elite regiments, and a regent who embraced all forms of pomp and ceremony, military fops had become regular characters in society pages and satirical works by 1818. Two groups, however, sought to lampoon these dandies for their own purposes, both personal and political. The first group are those artists and authors who specifically targeted officers who had purchased commissions after the Napoleonic Wars. Many of these young bloods, in an attempt to disguise their lack of proven martial prowess, took advantage of the army's cost-saving requirement that they purchased their own uniforms and pushed their tailors to extremes. They compensated for the lack of experience with pigeon breasts, padded shoulders, skin-tight breeches and sleeves, and overly large boots and headgear. Satirists, recognizing the inherent absurdity of these macaronis, exaggerated their accessories and uniform cuts to even more absurd lengths and feigned terror at their false bravado. The political views of these creatives varied. Some were relatively conservative and viewed these dandies as a blot on an otherwise noble and dignified profession, while others saw the problems in the army's organization and policies, but still chose to concentrate on its youngest officers. Overall, the satire directed at the unbloodied and compensating military dandies, while scathing, is not overly critical of the military as a whole, and often employed veteran officers as unwitting allies, holding them up as laudable figures and a stark contrast to this new generation of preening popinjays. The second group of satirists were much more obviously politically motivated. Made up of those with radical or at least pro-reform views, these individuals seized on the expensive and gaudy displays of military fops as a perfect example of poor taste in the economic downturn following, following Waterloo. While the general population might not have shared their view that the army, and especially its officer corps, was, to quote Thackeray, the most enormous job of all our political institutions, they did support a significant reduction in the peacetime service, and many who were struggling financially would have chafed to see such displays of wealth worn openly. Satirizing military fops, therefore, was a socially acceptable way of criticizing the military establishment as a whole. In these more pointed works, we find no exception for the officers who fought through the peninsula and at Waterloo. Instead, several of the works were particularly disdainful of them, implying that they were held to a higher standard and had signally failed to reach it. In order to examine the differences between these two groups and their styles of satire, this paper will contrast, contrast the works of William Heath, whose prolonged association with the military made him particularly scornful of these young officers who sought to replace experience with frippery, with George Cruikshank, whose more radical views and inherent sense of fairness were deeply offended by military dandies, whether they had seen action or not. It is unclear whether William Heath had a military career alongside his artistic one, but even if he never wore a uniform himself, his life was intrinsically linked to the army. Self-described in 1819 as a, quote, portrait and military painter, his income in the years after Waterloo came not from satirical prints, but his work as an illustrator in a, for a number of popular and patriotic military texts, most notably historical, and mil historical military and naval anecdotes of 1815, the martial achievements of Great Britain and her allies, also 1815, and the Wars of Wellington, published in 1819. Even after he turned his attention back to satire, he was more conservative than some of his colleagues, and his best-known prints are probably those he produced in 1829, in protest of Catholic emancipation. His open satire of military dandies is, therefore, on the surface, an anomaly. Upon further examination, however, it is clear that Heath's target in these works is not the officer corps in general, but those that had joined the service after Waterloo. The first of these to reach the public print market, Military Dandies or Heroes of 1818, illustrate that Heath's antipathy to this particular class of officer occurred even as he was glorifying the exploits of those he had, that had served under Wellington. 
It depicts eight officers of different regiments promenading and talking to each other, all in extravagant uniforms with exaggerated details. All have very tight waists and wear incredibly high collars and or stocks, which in several cases are pushing their heads back at an uncomfortable angle. Two of the cavalry officers are in thigh-high riding boots, which widen the top to an absurd degree, while two of the officers, an infantryman and a lancer, wear an overly large shako and chapka, respectively, each with a very high plume. All of the officers boast inflated bulging pigeon breasts, tight sleeves, and overly padded shoulders, all forms of traditional visual shorthand used to connote dandyism. Notably, only one officer depicted, the lifeguard at the center of the piece, wears the Waterloo Medal. While at the time, military, well, it's, sorry, where's the Waterloo Medal? While the title, Military Dandies or Heroes of 1818, invites the viewer to contrast those dandies, the heroes of 1818, with the heroes of the recently ended war. This comparison is furthered by Heath's tacit feminization of the officers. He highlights their thighs and buttocks, as well as their exaggerated postures. This general depiction not only further emphasized the connection with civilian dandies, but also encourages comparisons with the explicitly masculine coded representations of soldiers found in his illustrations for the Wars of Wellington and similar volumes. Heath took a broader but equally dismissive approach two years later when he produced Military Parade, again for the London publisher SW Fours. Expanding his canvas, Heath depicts 18 soldiers strolling in a park, not a single one of whom wears the Waterloo Medal. This wider perspective allows Heath to ridicule the size of his subjects, turning two heavy cavalrymen into giants, while several lancers barely come up to their chests, and one diminutive foot guards officer does not even reach their waists. Again, the cuts of uniforms are exaggerated and dandified, with extremely high collars, pigeon chest, chests, padded shoulders, and headgear that is often several feet tall, and in the case of the foot guard, the same height as the officer wearing it. While most of the officers are not feminized to the same level as the subjects of military dandies or heroes of 1818, the piece does include several soldiers with wasp waists and a Highlander in the background in a rather risque mini kilt. In addition to highlighting size disparities and providing more subjects, Heath's distance from his subjects allows him to completely anonymize them. By eschewing any facial details beyond the occasional mustache, he not only removes any individuality of person rather than regiment, but also makes the soldiers seem to disappear into their uniforms. This effect is furthered, further emphasized by the three soldiers that are completely swallowed by their cloaks, with only their headgear and boots visible, while another in the background appears to be nothing but a walking half cloak. While the effect of a uniform on an individual's psyche and sense of identity is a crucial part of military theory, Heath takes it to such extremes that the result is, at first glance, not an illustration of 18 soldiers, but instead several groups of animated uniforms. The meaning is clear. These are men playing a part, a case where, where clothes quite literally made the men. Heath returns to the theme of playing soldiers in 1834 in the first plate of his military sketches entitled Playing at Soldiers at Home, parentheses, Morning. The print depicts a dandified cavalry officer lounging in his rooms. He wears his uniform trousers without boots and a fern-lined robe in place of his uniform jacket and wields, instead of his regulation sword, a hussar pipe. While lacking the exag exaggerated physical attributes of Heath's previous military dandies, the officer does still sport a narrow waist, carefully coiffed hair, a studied and primped expression, and a hint of a very narrow mustache. The officer is presented in contra contrast to his Batman, who stands at attention in full uniform that is drawn in a style more reminiscent of Heath's portrait and narrative work than his satirical prints. Damningly, the accoutrements of the officer's rank, his swords, sabotage, Roman pattern, dra pattern dragoon helmet, undress cap, cloak, breastplate, and boots adorn his room as decorations rather than being stored or laid out for easy donning. To further highlight the decorative rather than utilitarian nature of these items, the officer's diminutive coachman stands next to his boots, which are almost as tall as he is. Dressed to perform his duties and holding his driving whip, his very presence emphasizes that the officer's thigh-high riding boots will not be put to their intended purpose, but will instead rest comfortably on the floor of the dandy's carriage. <laughs> 
Even as Heath was alternatively celebrating military service and lampooning those he regarded that regarded it merely, merely as a pastime, George Cruikshank was taking a firm stance against the entirety of what Timothy Alborn has christened milit Britain's military sartorial complex. A moderate radical who lambasted anarchy and republicanism as fer fervently as royal venality and political corruption, Cruikshank had been a fervent supporter of the war effort. He played drilled at the age of 11 besides his father's volunteer regiment, and even briefly considered a career in the Royal Navy before realizing that the most effective and profitable weapon he could wield against Bonaparte was his stylus. As the war progressed, however, Cruikshank began to balance his antipathy to Napoleon with an equal disdain for the Prince Regent, old corruption, and the excesses of certain portions of Britain's, and especially London's, population. These feelings came to the fore in the economic downturn that followed peace in 1815, and Cruikshank took particular aim at dandies and all those who took fashion to an extreme level while others were suffering from severe hardship. From 1816 until 1825, Cruikshank produced an annual or semi-annual print entitled Monstrosities Of that skewered trends and those that followed them slavishly. The military was not exempt from this particular assault, for Cruikshank shared the radical MP Joseph Hume's feeling that officers bedecked in, quote, scarlet and gold daily parading around the streets could have been tailor-made to mock the squalid poverty of the lower orders. Officers appear in all but one of Cruikshank's monstrosities and are central characters in five of them. Monstrosities of 1816 and Monstrosities of 1819 and 20 both boast cavalry officers, a hussar and a shako and a police and a lancer and a chapka with the regularization mustaches, tight trousers, and gold braid. Their poses are studied, with right hand on hips, pigeon chest foot thrust forward, and sabers held at a precise angle to be both deeply suggestive and simultaneously imply a certain lack of functionality. Monstrosities of 1821 features an officer of the foot guards, whose scrawny legs and slight build manages to maintain, make, manages to make uh, its still figure appear to totter under the weight of a gigantic bearskin, fully two-thirds the height of its wearer. Dandies are monstrosities of 1818, and monstrosities of 1783 and 1823 uh, also contain cavalry officers, this time lifeguards, sporting Roman patterned dragoon helmets and massive plumes. A particular note here is the officer in dandies or monstrosities of 1818, who proudly wears his Waterloo medal, and in his padded shoulders and tight trousers, could be the twin of the medal-wearing officer in Heath's military dandies or heroes of 1818. Cruikshank most, most direct assault on military dandies and came in February 19 with the release of his Ancient Military Dandies of 1450, sketched by permission from the originals in the Grand Armory at the Gothic Hall, Pall Mall, Modern Military Dandies of 1819, sketched without permission from life. Set up as a deliberate comparison between warriors of the 15th century and those of the 19th, the piece depicts seven visitors to the exhibition of arms and armor at the Gothic Hall. Two full suits of armor are displayed in more dynamic poses than armor is usually displayed in, and boast narrowed waists, full chests, and elaborate plumes on their helmets. The grandest suit stands with one hand on hip and the other holding a sword, and his helmet is open, revealing a lifelike face with a neat van dyke. Despite the outward nods to dandyism that Cruikshank gives them, their poses are more traditionally military. They stand straight and ready, and even accounting for their slightly elevated positions, are by far the tallest figures in the room. At the center of the print, examining the suits of armor arm in arm are two officers, one a lifeguard and one a lancer. Both have wasp waists, pigeon breasts, and padded shoulders, and wear uniforms that cling tightly to their arms and legs. Their uniforms have high, tight collars that thrust their heads back so far, it seems their unit helmet chin straps must choke them, and yet each bears a markedly supercilious expression. Finally, each has the toe of one foot extended, in a manner that emphasizes the rehearsed nature of their postures. Behind them stand two more officers in conversation with a lady completely enveloped by her bonnet and police. One is a foot guard officer, wearing the enormous bearskin that has that was, by at this point, becoming a trope in military prints. He too wears a superior expression, and the bulge, bulge both above and below his red officer's sash 
implies that he has long relied on port and beefsteak rather than padding to fill out his uniform. Finally, behind and somewhat obscured by the lady, stands another officer with a tucked waist, skin-tight sleeves, padded shoulders, and a plumed cap that seems to be in danger of swallowing his head. All wear overly long officer sashes, whose ends flutter near their calves, and both officers sport Waterloo medals. The foot guards officer, in addition to his Waterloo medal, wears the army slash peninsula gold cross, meaning that he had served as a battalion commander or higher in at least four battles between 1808 and 1814. Cruikshank was fully aware that this depiction of officers was unflattering, a point he emphasized by including in the prince title that they were sketched without permission from the life. Nor did it bother him that they were all veterans. In contrast to Heath, his targets were not unbloody junior officers trying to ape their superiors, but the excesses of the army as a whole. Lampooning military dandies was a socially acceptable way of criticizing the service in general, and the officer corps in particular. And for Cruikshank, a Waterloo Medal or Peninsula Cross should not shield one from wider responsibilities and criticism when those responsibilities were flouted. Whether a satirist's target was the entire British army or new unbloodied officers who tried to make up for their lack of experience with sartorial swagger and braggadocio, the result was largely the same. Their efforts combined to reshape the British army's officer corps image in the minds of a large portion of the British public from the saviors of Europe to absurd dandies. They were aided in this by the regiments and officers themselves. Hussar the regiments made mustaches a great requirement for all officers, a regulation that was decried in the press as a dangerously foreign dandyism that was inevitably incongruous and coxcombish when pasted on an English countenance. Despite a move towards more streamlined uniforms, uh, the tailoring became more exact, the luxuries multiplied, and the cost continued to grow. By 1828, Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine estimated the cost of outfitting an officer with regimentals at 500 pounds and dismissed the result of this expense as rendering the British soldier unfit for anything but a dandy. Quote, if Englishmen have beaten their enemies without the help of mustaches and beards, cuirasses and enormous conical caps, blue coats and lace enough on one of them to eat up the fortune of a younger son, Blackwoods continue, let us do without these absurdities and fight with clean faces and limbs clothed in the same color in which Marlborough rode over the field of Blenheim. A quarter century later, the situation had not improved, and the economist was forced to compare the day-to-day -day life of an officer in the Crimea to their previous life in the lap of the most enervating luxury and indulgence, where they were accustomed to the London clubs, to silver dressing cases, to the most careful and elaborate toilettes, who never washed without eau de cologne or almond soap, and rejoiced in the spotless polish of their varnished boots, and finally, who gave their mind, whole minds to the tie of their cravats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, another uh, another equally uh, excellent paper. It's really been uh, been splendid tonight. Uh, I, I'm going to steal a, a chair's privilege and, and ask a question myself before I uh, I go to the ones on on the uh, on, on the floor. I've not had a chance tonight. You touched very briefly on this, but I, I wonder if you might be able to say a little bit more. A lot of this fashion uh, had royal influences. I mean, I'm thinking of the Prince Regent in particular uh, uh, as the uh, the military dandy with the, uh, the, the the budget to support it and the whole army to dress up. To some, it, would it be the case to some extent that by satirising the uniforms, it was actually the the prince uh, and and so on that, 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 were, that were the real targets? Certainly, to to an ex to a certain extent, and um, you know, some of his more favored regiments, um, the the one nicknamed the Prince's Dolls, for example, do come in for particular satire. I will say, however, that um, you know, a lot of these artists, more more Crookshank than Heath, um, had no hesitation in going right after the Prince Regent themselves. In fact, at one point, once he became George the Fourth. Um, he invited Crookshank and his publisher down to Brighton, paid for their entire journey, just to beg them to stop harassing him. Yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Right, so uh, from the floor then, a question from Ewan. Uh, 
Is there any evidence that the Prussians experienced anything of the exquisite militaire? Uh, and did they go into Waterloo tourism to anything like the extent that the British did? Uh, there is some indication of that, uh, although in, in Prussia, the, the very close ties between um, levels of society and levels of military service and, and the army in general uh, prevented a little bit of that. The French, however, did suffer their own version called the Calico, uh, which was uh, both a, a problem of, with serving ar army officers and those who merely decided to dress like serving army, serving army officers without actually serving. Um, and they were loud, largely sort of uh, parodied and lampooned in exactly the same way. In terms of uh, Waterloo tourism, Almost every nation that was involved in Waterloo found some way to make their way there for tourism one way or another. Uh, the numbers we have, however, do suggest that it was wholeheartedly dominated by the British until the 1850, into the 1850s, when it was actually taken over by the Americans as the largest population. However, yes, there were Prussians there um, to a decent extent. And their favorite habit there seems to have been baiting the English into getting into arguments about whether Blucher or Wellington won the battle. Thank you. I, uh, I, I, I thought you were about to say they were going to uh, um, uh, baiting the, uh, the French visitors over all the, uh, all the monuments, although possibly they weren't, uh, they weren't there that early. Um, I'm, not, I'm just going to double check the... Uh, the public chat. I don't believe we have any more questions. Uh, if anybody has one, do please shout out. I'll hang on a moment. I, no. I should. Um, I, I will. I will throw a, a note to the society's um, excellent journal, in that if you are interested in um, in the hussars' mandatory moustache. Uh, there was a piece uh, published by John Rumsby in the autumn of 2018 issue, which is a, it's an entire article. It's a social history of the cavalry moustache, and it is excellent. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. We've got one, 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 one question then, uh, which is from, uh, from Ashley. He says, I recall no such uh, fopperism, sorry, I'm going to put it up on the screen. Uh, I recall no such fopperism during the Peninsula Campaign or Waterloo. So was all this merely a product of peacetime boredom? I think it was partially a product of peacetime boredom. Um, as, I, as I say, for those that had not served, I think it very much is an attempt to um, compensate for, for those, you know, compared to those with experience, uh, much like in, in modern uh, pastimes, you know, sort of new people occasionally will spend massive amounts of money to try and compete uh, with, um, with those with experience instead. Um, I think it was also to a certain extent, just a response to being home, to having different priorities and, and to, again, yes, being surrounded by a London society that was aesthetic, and a um, and again a court of a prince regent, and then George the Fourth, who was obsessed with all forms of display, both military and civilian. Thank you. Uh, I, I actually, following on to some, some extent from that, from uh, from Philip, uh, do you think that excessive elaboration? Acted, acted as a further layer of social exclusion uh, from those regiments wished to keep out on grounds of expense. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. The, uh, the, the classic example of this, although it happens in the 1820s rather than in the immediate aftermath, uh, is the, the case of the King's, uh, the, the Tenth Hussars, and a uh, rather unfortunate fellow by the name of Cornet Battier. Um, and basically, this rumor goes around that he is the son of a merchant rather than the son of a general officer. And he is deliberately excluded in every way from um, from the company. And yes, you know, part of their outrageous uniforms were clearly designed to to keep them exclusive. The the tenth, for the record, was uh, one of the regiments that Bo Brummel spent time in. Thank you. Um... I, 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 I'll ask this. I mean, don't, don't feel obliged to reply because it's, 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 it's a personal question around the question about your, uh, your talk. But uh, uh, just one, one from, from Ken here asking, asking uh, uh, are you a member of the Company of Military Historians? 
I am not, um, but it is a, it is an organization that is on my radar, and I have just pulled up their membership page. So uh, the answer is no, not yet. Let's go with that. I say I, sus I suspect that may have been the subtext of the question. But, uh... <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, cl cl clearly you've impressed people if they want to recruit you. So that that, 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 that seems pretty pretty impressive, uh, Bryce. Right. That that seems to have brought us to the uh, the end of the questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, could I ask you to to uh, to stay where you are uh, for a moment? Uh, I know we've we, we've lost Rick unfortunately because of his prior commitment. But if I could ask our other other speakers to. Uh, uh, to return to the stage for for a moment, uh, and also if Dudley, could you uh, could you make yourself visible as well? I'd just like to take the opportunity then. Now we've uh, we've heard the final paper of the final session of the uh, uh, the centenary research conference that uh, as. Uh, uh, as, you, as you were saying there, Luke seems to have been uh, the years in the uh, the making and, uh, and 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 decades in the uh, the, the delivery of. Um, I'd just like to finish with the thank yous first of all to the to all the speakers tonight and and, and sorry to the, the three of you who are, who are here. Uh, I should like to thank uh, Eamon O'Keefe, who uh, uh, was involved with the organisation from the beginning uh, and uh, worked with me to select all the uh, the papers. Uh, and as well, and then chaired two of the panels in the uh, in the spring. Um, I would like to thank all the people who were involved in the uh, the organisation of the the excellent live session um, that we held last month at the National Army Museum. Uh, and last of all, I'd like to thank Dudley because I think without him, this entire uh, thing would have floundered horribly. Uh, with, uh, with with a lack of technological ability uh, and, and and COVID induced uh, inability to, uh, to 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 present in in, in the flesh, you, you you've been an absolute star throughout this, and uh, probably far more patient than uh, than, than I deserved with uh, uh, some of the things that uh, that we've thrown at you. So uh, thank you very much. Most of all, uh, at the end of all this, you can take a uh, take a well deserved rest now. Thank you for coming out of retirement for this one last session uh, when when you thought it was all over. It, it really is appreciated. Great. Thank you. Right. Well, that, that concludes matters. I, I, I'm going to switch myself off and, uh, and go and have a glass of something. I'm sure the other uh, uh, speakers will, uh, will will be heading to do the same. Uh, so uh, thank you. Oh, well, sorry. One moment uh, before I forget. Uh, for those of you who are members uh, and well, and members in the UK, I suppose a better better add uh, with, with apologies to the transatlantic contingent. The, the final act of the centenary is, of course, a centenary dinner on the on the 12th of November. Uh, which, which uh, tickets are still available from. If you're not a member, uh, find a member who's going and try and get to go as their guest. There are spaces for guests, so uh, there's, uh, there, there's no excuse other than, uh, than, than distance uh, for that one, and all the details should have gone out to, to members and are on the website. Uh, but on, on that note, uh, I think we can uh, safely bring the, uh, the evening's proceedings to a close. Thank you all, uh, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.